The Pixel 9 series was unveiled a week ago in Mountain View at the Made by Google event, which I was lucky enough to attend for the first time. Google provided me this unit, the Google Pixel 9, for review, which I've been using for the past week. And while I'm not ready to give my full review of the phone quite yet anyways, I do want to showcase the things that you're going to want to know, see, and do with the device if you choose to get one. Plus, I definitely have some thoughts to share on it at this stage of the process. Now do note that though Google did loan me this device for review, Google does not get any sort of approval over what I produce and release in this video and those that follow. So without further ado, let's first go over the things you need to know about the Pixel 9. So first and foremost, the Pixel 9 is available for purchase today for $799, you can check the description for links to buy the device. And with that said, let's kind of take a look to begin with, with the hardware details that you're gonna to wanna to know off the top. The Pixel 9, which is right here, this is the baseline device in the Pixel 9 family. And it comes in four colors, porcelain, which is what I have here, obsidian, wintergreen, and peony, which if you see peony in person, my goodness, it just jumps off the table. It's beautiful. It's this bright pink, uh, almost looks electrified, uh, really cool stuff. Now on the Pixel 9, we've got a very different kind of approach when we're talking about the design compared to the previous version, the Pixel 8, which I also happen to have, you can see the 8 is kind of rounded on the sides. The 9 does not do that. I mean, it's very slightly rounded around the edgy edges, but the side itself is very flat. It's a brushed aluminum frame, also coupled in a very seamless transition to a polished glass backing. It's kind of a shiny backing um, of glass and you know, which gives it a little bit of a slippery character, something to keep in mind. Uh, the display on the front is a flat display, which is definitely the trend on premium phones. Now it's funny how we've come full circle. Um, flat sides, like I said, uh, along with the flat top and the flat back, definitely giving some people iPhone vibes. I think it's just really flat, you know, flat phone design vibes and iPhone has done it. Many other Android devices have done it. But when you compare side by side with last year's model, it's a big difference. I mean, last year's model and the ones that came before it really leaned heavily in the kind of waterfall approach, the curving at the sides that fall into the next, you know, piece of the hardware. And this one is very different. The Pixel 9 really goes for that straight edgy approach, but not edgy to a point of discomfort. These edges are rounded slightly and it really does feel wonderful and comfortable in the hand. It's a very comfortable device to hold. Now the display itself is a 6.3 inch Actua display. Actua is kind of Google's technology that demonstrates how it does in brightness. It offers solid brightness outdoors. It is protected by Gorilla Glass Victus 2. And speaking of brightness, it's 35% brighter outdoors um, and in its peak brightness than the Pixel 8 that came before it. It's hard to see indoors here. They both look pretty sufficiently bright, but when you go outside, you do see a little bit of that bump. It's basically 2000 nits of brightness on the Pixel 8 versus 2700 nits of peak brightness on the Pixel 9. Um, I will admit to my eyes, it was a little hard to tell the difference, so take that with a grain of salt. Now on the back, you know, one of the other big striking differences here is that the Pixel 8 has this kind of squared approach for the camera bump. The Pixel 9, of course, goes for the rounded kind of pill-shaped quality. And, you know, it's just a really beautiful contrast, similar to what we had here. We had a nice contrast between glass and the uh, the metal casing of the camera bump last year as well. But this time, it just, it, it feels a little bit more like an island. It doesn't quite merge into the sides. And uh, I don't know, I think it was, I think it was about time for Google to kind of change the formula a little bit while still sticking to the same idea, which is, you know, this like visor approach that we're getting on their devices right now. Now. So it still has that pixel signature, the characteristic that we're used to looking for. And also it 
does happen to carry with it the benefit of being a great place to rest your finger as the previous device had that as well. You can kind of rest it like that as you thumb around on it. Same with the Pixel 9, although I would imagine, at least for myself, I'd be getting a case on this bad boy because if this hits the ground, I mean, yes, it's got the Victus uh, to protect it, but there isn't a whole lot keeping it <laughs> from cracking the screen. And if there's someone who can you know, put that to the test, it's usually me, so I'll be putting a case on it. Uh, as for inside of the Pixel 9 and the entire Pixel 9 family, you get the Tensor G4 chip. That's a four nanometer process. But what you do get that's different in the Pixel 9 versus the rest of the family of Pixel 9 devices is less RAM. You get 12 gigs of RAM versus 16 gigs on all of the other devices. And that's important to note because... The Pixel 9 is definitely an AI-driven device. The entire series is, right? Google is really going in on its Gemini processing and Gemini Nano on the device. And in order to do that, you need a fast processor, which, you know, Gemini is ample for the AI processing, but you also need a lot of RAM to handle those tasks. And so likely what you're going to see when you put the 9 up against the 9 Pro and Pro XL and the 9 Pro Fold, you're going to see a difference in the speed at which it does some of those on-device de processings uh, around artificial intelligence. Now, I don't have those devices to compare it personally or right now. I hope to in the future. And if so, I'll definitely put that through the test and uh, see how that comes up. Now, as for the battery on the device, 4,700 milliamp hours in my short amount of time with this, no complaints. I haven't really, you know, come into any issues there. Ending the day roughly around 40% uh, remaining by the time I put it on the charge at like 9 or 10 at night. It does have 45 watt wired charging, so that means 30 minutes of charge is equal to around 55% of battery. Um, and I'd say that's pretty spot on. It's a pretty, you know, reasonably fast, although not fastest in its class necessarily, but reasonably fast uh, charging. And then you get 27 watt wireless charging, same as the Pixel 8, uh, by the way. Now, rounding things out, yes, you do have, you know, uh, the software that we've come to expect of the Pixel devices. Here we have Android 14 with Android 15 launching very soon. So it's notable that it's not launching right out of the gate with Android 15. Um, but you should not, my understanding, have to wait very long for 15 to hit the device. It also will be hitting the Pixel 8 as well. So keep that in mind. If you're considering upgrading, that might not be the best reason to do it because you'll get it either way. Um, but yes, you'll also get those seven years of software updates, which is at this point, another big signature of the Pixel devices. Google was really out ahead of the rest of the competition in Android land uh, with that seven year commitment for updates. And you know, we've got the Tensor G4 chip, you've got 12 gigs, which should be relatively sufficient. But again, this is where the 16 gigs of RAM is gonna come in really handy when what you're looking for is longevity. Hey there, real quick, if you like what you see, Go ahead and give the video a thumbs up. Do it right now. It really helps the video to reach new audiences. Definitely something that I'm trying to do with my videos. So thank you for the help. Now, speaking of things to see, let's talk a little bit about the camera. You know, it takes pictures that you, that you want to look at. Hopefully it's taking great pictures that you want to look at for a long time. And Pixel phones have been really good about this year after year after year. Part of its software, part of its hardware. And here with the Pixel 9, you get... Uh, no improvement to the main camera lens. It's actually the same lens from the Pixel 8. So that's a 50 megapixel lens, f1.68 aperture, which is nice for lower light with a 1 to 1.31 inch sensor. Um, does it really matter that this isn't an upgrade? No, because like I said, Google is really uh, also coupling their hardware improvements in the camera realm with their software improvements, and especially now at this point when AI is sprinkled all over the place inside of these phones, you're going to see improvements over time as Google improves its algorithms and everything. So main camera lens not getting an upgrade, not as big a deal. However, 
the ultra wide lens is an upgrade. It's a 48 megapixel with an f1.7 aperture, better in low light, up from 12 megapixel ultra wide on the Pixel 8 with an f2.2 aperture. That was actually on the previous two generations. So this will result in better looking wide shots in lower light conditions. And we kind of know about this. Google has been touting its low light performance. So of course now they're you know placing their attention on not just the main lens, but the other lenses to kind of catch that up. Uh, in my experience, it certainly uh, lives up to the promise there. It definitely improves the shots. Overall, the shots that I've taken with this so far, they're excellent kind of as as I've expected uh, pixel shots usually are, so that's no surprise. Now, one camera feature that immediately shows improvements is nighttime panorama. This is a huge upgrade on the Pixel 9. I took this panorama shot out on the street at night with the Pixel 8, and as you can see, it turned out mucky. It's kind of blurry. It really doesn't look that great. The Pixel 9 by comparison is miles ahead in sharpness. You get that clarity. It really is a huge step up. Now, another thing that you can see, because there really isn't a whole lot you can do with it other than kind of refer to it, is the Pixel Weather app. And let me tell you, people who love their weather apps, they were really happy about this inclusion. Uh, Google has updated its weather app. Uh, and actually what they've done is they've decoupled it from the Google search app. So now it is its own standalone app, as you saw right there. It's got its own uh, standard app icon. And they've totally changed the design of it. And it's made, they've made things very graphical, really heavily leaning into the Material U design aesthetic. You could almost see all of these at some point becoming their own widgets on your home screen. In fact, I'm kind of surprised they didn't have that uh, to begin with right out of the gate. But um, you've got your precipitation, your wind, sunrise and sunset, UV index, air quality, visibility, humidity, and air pressure down at the very bottom. So you've got all of those different things, a weather map, a 10-day forecast, of course, yes, your standard hourly forecast. But what's really interesting here is up at the top is a fun little AI portion of the app, and it calls it out, AI Weather Report. We'll go ahead and open that up. And essentially, this is powered by Gemini Nano. It writes a miniature weather report based on all of the information that it gleans when it runs it. And it's so for instance, what it's telling me right now, pleasant evening, because it is 630 in the evening with comfortable temperatures and clean air moderate for rest of today with temperatures between 56 degrees and 73 degrees Fahrenheit. Good air, air quality at the moment. It does also call it out and say, hey, it is AI generated. They're probably <laughs> doing a little bit of advanced apologetic work there just in case it gets something wrong. But um, really, this is a very minimal summary. And in my experience with generative AI, summary, you know, taking different pieces of information from different sources combining it all together and coming up with like a cohesive summary of it is something that generative AI is generally pretty good at. And so this makes a lot of sense that it would do this. Um, I could also see at some point, you know, having the ability to read this out loud as if you were like tuning into a radio station and you wanted to get the weather update. Like I'm kind of surprised again that they don't have that here uh, because their systems already are set up to do that sort of thing. I bet you will see that in the future. So I'm calling it some sort of voice readout of the weather forecast and widgets of all those things that you saw within the app. I'm There's no indication that this is absolutely happening, but I really would be surprised if both of those things don't happen sometime in the coming future uh, with updates to the app. Hey, real quick, once more, if you love what you see, well then subscribe. There's more like it on the horizon and you're not gonna miss it that way. So thank you for subscribing. And finally, we'll round things out with possibly the most fun section there is today, and that's things to do. What can you do with your Pixel 9 that you can't do with other phones, or you can't do yet, or you can do right out of the box that you're gonna to wanna to check out? Well, big surprise, it all has to do with artificial intelligence. That's certainly the story that Google has presented, and they've roped in a number of different examples of why you're gonna to wanna to do this. One of those examples of course, probably the kind of marquee example of that is Gemini Live. It's now embedded into the Gemini app. 
Gemini Advanced, which if you get the Pixel 9 series, you do get some, uh, I think it's a year of Gemini Advanced for free. So you can check out a lot of these features and get hooked on them essentially is what I think Google's hoping for and then want to pay for it in the future. But Gemini Live is a way to talk to Gemini in more of a conversational tone. Yes, you could use the microphone to ask a question, but this is really about conversation. Oh, and I should also mention it's not multimodal yet. So it's purely talk-based at this point. You can't also point it, you know, the camera at something and say, hey, what is this? We're going to get that at some point with Project Astra down the line. Google's already alluded to that. But earlier today, I recorded a conversation that I had with Gemini Live about identifying classic Android phones. Hey, Gemini, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. It's always nice to hear from someone. How can I help you today? Well, I got a bunch of phones from a friend of mine, and I'm trying to identify exactly what the model is. Can you help me? So do you want me to help you find the exact model of the phones? Yeah, I'd like to describe the phones to you and see if you can determine what phones I'm talking about. Okay, I'm ready. What's the first phone look like? The first phone that I have is a little black phone. On the back, it says with Google on it. And on the front, it has four, no, it looks like five buttons. One of them is a green phone, a home button, a back button, and then a red phone. And what makes this phone unique is that the display itself swivels out to reveal a keyboard underneath. Oh, and up at the top it says T-Mobile. Can you help me identify this phone? Okay, based on your description, it sounds like you might be holding a T-Mobile G1. That was one of the first Android phones ever. Do you think that's it? <laughs> I know that's it. That's exactly the phone that I have. It's the T-Mobile G1. That was really impressive. It's kind of a classic. It's fun to geek out on the history of these older phones. All right, ready for phone number two? I am absolutely ready for phone number two. I was lucky enough to get into my possession another pretty classic phone. This one actually has a sparkly glass back on it, and it has LG down at the bottom. It does say the word Nexus with a single camera. And, I mean, looking at the front of the device, it's pretty nondescript, just a glass front with some pretty large bezels up at the top and the bottom. Can you tell me what phone this is and when it was released? Okay, that sounds like the LG Nexus 5X. It was one of Google's Nexus phones, and it came out. Mm, I'll have to check that, but I think it was 2015. Okay, no, that's actually wrong. This is not the Nexus 5X. You're close, though. Let me tell you a little bit more about this because I don't think I was exactly uh, clear. The very back of the device is a flat glass back, and it has this sparkly pattern that shimmers when you rotate the phone in the light. It's actually kind of an eye-catching piece if you see it in real life. Does that help? Okay, that's helpful. A couple of things come to mind. It could be an LG G4 or an LG G5. Both of those phones came out around the same time and had similar features. Is the battery removable? The battery is not removable. And though this phone is made by LG, it also has the word Nexus on it. What do you think that means? All right, so it's definitely an LG and it's got a non-removable battery. Hmm, couple more questions. Does it have a fingerprint scanner on the back? No, this, I believe, was done before fingerprint scanners were a thing. Let me repeat one piece of very important information. It has the word Nexus on the back. All right, that narrows it down. You're most likely holding an LG Nexus 4. That's the only other Nexus phone LG made with a glass back. It came out in 2012. All right, you nailed it. You got there. It took a little while, but you got there. <laughs> All right, ready for phone number three? All right, this one could be a bit of a challenge. This phone is bright yellow. The casing is bright yellow. If I look on the back, 
of the bright yellow casing, there's a big circle, a black circle, on one side with a singular camera inside of it. Printed on it says 41 megapixel pure view Zeiss. Now what makes this weird is when I flip it over, it's got a Windows logo down on the bottom along with a back arrow and a search button. And making it even more interesting is that the case itself has the word Android on it. Though, if I'm not mistaken, this might be a Windows phone because of the window logo at the bottom on the front. Can you help me identify this phone? It's very peculiar. All right, that sounds like a Nokia Lumia 1020. It was pretty unique back in the day with that huge camera bump. It could run both Windows phone and Android, though I think Android was more of a hack than an official thing. Oh, okay. That's really, really helpful. Thank you so much, Gemini. That explains it because I think you nailed it. I just wasn't so, aware that it could run. Do you run... have any other phones you want help identify? <laughs> yeah, I think it was a pretty interesting experiment at the time. It let developers try out Android apps on a Windows phone, but it wasn't officially supported. You got any other phones to show me? No, I think you've done a really great job. Thank you so much. All right. No problem. Thanks for letting me help out. Have a great day. Now, that's pretty rad, I have to say. I'm super excited to kind of see how this gets built out and becomes the next phase, which we, you know, which is pretty obvious, the Project Astro demo that they've been doing that is truly multimodal. That's where this is all heading. Okay, another feature that have got that has gotten people really excited about the Pixel 9 and the AI improvements is a camera feature called AdMe. And uh, definitely one of the marquee features. My question with this, so if I go into the camera app, I can go over to add me mode and it's an actual mode that you have to go into. It recognizes when there are human beings standing in the shot. I tried it with my dog. It didn't work. Um, my question with how this would go down with non techies was, you know, is someone who isn't super adept with technology, which, you know, by and large is probably a lot of the people that are going to buy a pixel phone. Are they going to get that mode and know intuitively what to do with it? Is it easy to use or is it kind of confusing? And I actually roped my family in on this one to get an answer for that. We were hiking uh, in the mountains over the weekend. And while we were hiking uh, in the woods, I asked my wife and my daughter to line up for a shot. And I took the shot. And then I asked my wife to come over to where I was standing and gave her the phone and said, all right, it's going to you know, want to line me up. So tell me where to go and you know, just follow the directions. And I will say there was a bit of confusion on where she should stand for framing, where I should go. But after a short pause, she snapped the shot. And honestly, you're seeing it right now. Things looked pretty great. And another time right before school, I asked my daughter to test the feature out with me. She lined up for the photo. I swapped places with her and she was a little confused at first by the overlay that she saw on the screen. But you know what? She figured it out pretty quickly and the resulting picture actually looks pretty good. I, I think in both cases, it can be a little confusing for them at first, but relatively easy to figure out based on the on-screen guides. Once you see the overlay, it really kind of becomes obvious what you're going for. One tip though, I definitely noticed, try not to overlap the second person on top of the first, maybe put a little bit of space in between them. Cause we did, we did a couple of tries on this. And when I was overlapping, you get a little bit of that weird uh, edging effect between them, it's almost like it couldn't stitch it perfectly. What it reminded me of is the on-device bokeh that you get in portrait mode, how sometimes it's just not perfect around the outline. You get that in between your subjects if you get people too close, but other times it would work. So I don't know, you know, maybe it's just a hit or miss. I mean, it is AI after all that's doing all this, all the stitching and everything, but Overall, I think it's a really neat combination of technology that Google has been honing over the years because it's not just AI, it's also its AR core, it's augmented reality that's part of what's you know placing the objects on top and you're intermingling with them. I think the big question that I have after using it a handful of times is, do I, as the picture taker, really feel the need <laughs> to place myself in the shot? I might be just as happy taking the shot and realizing there's somewhere else down the line that I'm going to end up in a shot more 
more organically. So that's my question there. Another experience, an app on the Pixel 9 that got me really excited when I was at the Made by Google event is the Pixel Screenshots app. And you might be thinking, okay, screenshots, you know, snore. Why do I need a special app for screenshots? Um, what I've found is that having the screenshots app and knowing what it can do for you changes my behavior of why and when I take screenshots. So before I might take a screenshot of important things and then refer to it and then just kind of forget about it because it was very disposable, right? And that's kind of the, that's, that, that was kind of the old paradigm. But after and having this app and knowing what it's capable of, I find that I'm using screenshots as a long-term reference tool. So it's really kind of changing why I'm using screenshots. It's almost like I have more faith in the fact that these things are going to stick around and be useful long-term, and so I can rely on them more. So how do you do this? Well, if I go to my Facebook app, let's say, and I find, you know, Facebook always serves a ton of ads. Okay, here's a perfect one because I've been considering getting this mic, the uh, Dockman uh, 87. Facebook knows me so well. So basically, I come in here and I do my phone's shortcut for taking a screenshot, which is volume down and, and power button, hold it down. It takes it. You can see it blink there. That's essentially telling me that it is scanning the screenshot now. It has saved it. And it is actively using the onboard AI to scan that and uh, extract information from it. So let's go in to the screenshots app. As you can see, I had already taken another screenshot of it another time, but here it is uh, that I just did. So we go in here and it's already done all of its magic. It was actually pretty fast. I think this is one of those moments where if you had the 16 gig version of any of the other Pixel 9 family, the processing on this would probably be faster. Here it's a, a little bit slower, but we didn't notice because we weren't here when it was happening. But essentially we've got all that information that was in that screenshot and down below it has pulled out that information and it has organized it. So it says document audio DA871 microphone sale, limited time offer with that code. It has the code number, save $100 at checkout. Uh, has the quote from Tape Op Magazine, a magazine that I really trust. Five-star rating from Tape Op Magazine, and it even notes that there's a commenter that not only has one, but bought a second one. That's how much they liked it. So, and then, of course, you can start throwing these into collections. So I can add that to a collection. I've got music production. I'll go ahead and throw it in there. And then it really becomes... This whole interface becomes kind of like a personal Pinterest. Now I've got all of these screenshots related to music that I can keep organized. I've got music production, which is where the microphone thing went. Um, all sorts of things that I start, I start interacting with my screenshots in a very different way. Now I did notice that screenshots from my old phone imported in, the only way to actually get them to process is to go into them like this one and process now and then you kind of get a sense of how long it takes to process this. I do wish there was a way to like auto scan older screenshots, but I gotta say, I am super into this feature. I know for a fact I'm gonna be using this app quite a bit to catalog and organize my screenshots. Um, oh, I couldn't process this screenshot. Well, it's obviously not perfect. <laughs> All right, let's direct our attention now on some of the image processing that we can do here. Now, the first thing that we we'll want to look at is Magic Editor. This is actually in combination with Google Photos, and this is pretty cool. It basically takes your photos library and allows you to change things up with generative AI. So I'm going to go into my photos and pull out this picture of my dog, the cute Bronson uh, running at the dog park, but it's kind of a perfect photo to allow us to illustrate what Magic Editor can actually do. We'll go ahead and go into edit mode and you see the little Magic uh, Editor button down here that was glowing, hit that, takes us into the mode. And now we can do a lot of fun things. I can tap the sky and that's going to actually outline as you see the trees and just select the sky. So I could reimagine the sky and turn it into a sunny day. And after a little bit of processing, you see now we've got some, some clouds, some blue sky up there. 
Um, and that is definitely different from what we had before, total cloud coverage. Uh, it kind of reimagines that sky, right? Maybe we want to reimagine this and put dragons in the sky. Hey, what do you know? <laughs> now Bronson's being chased by dragons. <laughs> That's actually pretty awesome. Oh, man, I love it. Uh, and then finally, we could change the ground and it'll etch around Bronson in the other way. Let's put him in the ocean. Not quite in water. It looks like a dried up ocean, if I'm truly honest. But uh, nonetheless, it's a lot of fun to get in here and just play around and see how you can change up the photos. Another capability of this is actually to correct images that you might have in your photo roll that are imperfect that you want to make an actual adjustment to. All right, so take this picture at the Google Play event that me and Ron Richards and Michelle Rahman, my, my friends on the Android Faithful podcast, we traveled out to New York for this event, and you can see that it's not a perfect image. We're standing in front of the thing, but you know our feet are kind of cut off. It's a little lopsided, so if we go into Edit and we go into the Magic Editor section, that kicks off the mode. And then what we can do is tap this and it actually recognizes, hey, maybe you want to reframe this. If I hit auto frame, it actually does the generation and jumps right in and I imagine straightens things out. Okay, so it, it generated the shoes. It's not entirely perfect. You can see Ron's shoe is a little strange right there, but that's okay. We got some other, okay, that one cropped in. This is another one that tried, you know, a different attempt down at the bottom. Well, that's pretty impressive. I mean, there's your before, there's your after. Fills in the gap, straighten things out, and kind of fills in all of the area um, that wasn't there before. And this could really save you with a picture that you actually love that didn't come out quite so perfect. And finally... This one's really cool. This is Pixel Studio. This is another app that launches on the Pixel 9 series right out of the box. And what this really is, is when you think of all of the, you know, the image generation AI that's happening right now, things like stable diffusion and everything, some of these things actually cost money. You know, you can, you can run a number of prompts through and create a certain number of images before you actually have to pay. Well, in this case, this is a personal mobile version of an image generator like that. In fact, it happens all on the device when you first launch this, and I've already done this, so I can't show it to you, but when you first launch the app, it actually downloads the current version of the model to your device, and then it's on there, and it's created on the device with the Tensor hardware that's underneath. And so everything that you create is kept on your device. You can create as many things as you want. So let's go ahead and create something. Let's create an Android bug droid in front of a sign that says Android Faithful. Okay, we'll turn that off and go ahead and put this in quotes. Sometimes that helps with things like this. You've got a little style button here. So we can go in there and we can say, you know, maybe we want this video game style or we want it to look like a sketch or sticker. I'm just going to leave it in freestyle for right now. We'll go ahead and trigger it. And it actually doesn't take very long. It comes back within, oh my goodness, that did a great job. And what you see there, okay, it didn't quite spell faithful, right? On, at first glance, it looked okay, but it says faith all with two L's, no F in faithful. So I could just trigger that and go again. AI, generative AI for images often has a hard time with words and this is no different. This is apparently not, you know, tailored specifically to word generation uh, as one of its strengths. But you could keep running this through. I mean, you're not burning through credits after all. It's on your device. And Oh man, it's got definitely has a certain theme that it's following here. Um, once you find something that you like, uh, Faith Lowell. Oh, I kind of like that. Uh, <laughs> unintentional, but I kind of like it. Um, you can go ahead in here and change the style. So I can go ahead and switch to a different style and see what it comes comes up with there. Um, you can give feedback. I imagine if it gave you some really poor 
uh, uh, generations that you want to tell Google about. This is one way to do it. You know, they're still you know developing this model and developing how it integrates and operates on the device. And then you can go in there and you can put a sticker on there to kind of liven it up. And then, yeah, sure. Although I probably wouldn't do that in real life. And then if I wanted to add my own thing, wow, I could add a caption. You know, I think they, uh, on the stage, when they were showing this off, they were, they were using the example of like, oh, you could use this to create an invite for an event or something like that. And okay. I mean, on the go, say you have time to kill and you're on the subway and you're creating an event for a chili cook-off uh, that's coming up in a couple of months. This might be a way to come up with something instead of having to wait until you get home, get onto a desktop computer and do that. And all of these things are stored over here in the My Projects folder. And you can kind of see all those projects kind of kept every single generation tied to that project and uh, keeps the history so you can refer to it later. Pretty cool stuff. That is Pixel Studio. Now, like I said, it's too soon for a full review, but next week on the Android Faithful podcast, me and the rest of the crew, we're going to be giving the Pixel 9 a full in-depth review together. It's going to be a lot of fun. AndroidFaithful.com or you can find the Daily Tech News Show YouTube channel and you'll find that episode when it publishes next Tuesday. I might even republish that particular segment on this channel. Undoubtedly, more to come on the Pixel 9 series hardware as I get my hands on the devices. And until then... Thank you so much for watching my take on Texploder. I hope you get one of these devices. Leave a comment down below and let me know what you think about them. We'll see you next time.